Hello and welcome to Psyched, the show where we explore psychedelics through social, economic, and political perspectives. our first couple speakers. Uh, we'll be having three speakers, I believe. I have intros for two of them. Uh, so first is Margaret, Margaret Fleming. Margaret is a co-founder of the Penn Society for Psychedelic Science and co-founder and co-organizer of the Intercollegiate Psychedelics Summit, an annual conference for the convergence of university-affiliated individuals hosted at Penn and Harvard in its first two years. She is also a co-founder and is on the executive team of the Intercollegiate Psychedelics Network, a network of 20 universities internationally that aims to reduce suffering through empowering students in psychedelic research, advocacy, and clinical interventions. She is a nonprofit advisor to the Sound Mind Clinic, which offers psychedelic therapy to individuals and populations disproportionately affected by trauma. She is also on a small team of volunteers who run Dharma Gates, a nonprofit that brings deep meditation practice to young adults. Margaret works in nonprofit consulting and holds an undergraduate degree from Cornell University and a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. The second individual, Victor Pablo Acero. Victor is a PhD candidate in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania. His research is focused on developing 3D tissue engineered test beds for psychedelic compounds, as well as assessing the therapeutic potential of psychedelics and reducing chronic inflammation and traumatic brain injury. He is a co-founder of the Penn Society for Psychedelic Science and the Intercollegiate Psychedelic Summit, an annual conference for the convergence of university affiliated individuals. He's also a co-founder and is on the executive team of the Intercollegiate Psychedelics Network, an international network of 20 universities aiming to reduce suffering through empowering students in psychedelic research, advocacy, and clinical practice. Margaret and Victor, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Psyched. Thanks so much. Sweet introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I'll let Emily take it away. Emily's also joining us. Uh, she's here with Victor and she's also part of the Intercollegiate Psychedelic Network. Thanks, Margaret. Yeah, um, I got involved with the project a little late. So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Rivas. Oh, uh, and I'm a third year uh, PhD student at Penn. Um, I'll be kicking us off by talking about how and why we developed this program in the first place. Uh, so let's get started. Okay, so as many of you know, uh, there have been significant advancements in psychedelic research since the turn of the century. Here you can see a visual representation of how fast the field has grown in terms of the number of psychedelic research publications per year. This explosion of knowledge in these substances as novel tools to study both consciousness and psychiatric illness has generated much interest from young students like us looking to get more involved. These students will be the face of the field 10, 20, and 30 years from now. Due to their significance in shaping the future of psychedelic science, they will be the target population for our program. So um, how do these students um, get involved with the space in the first place? After a quick Google search, they would likely find this article published by MAPS in 2006, advising students to conform to a related but distinct field of study to avoid ridicule until they develop sufficient research credibility and independence, a process that can take years. More recently, um, articles published in 2018 um, advise uh, self-examination, education, and internship work that usually involves data management and administrative tasks, unless you're lucky enough to um, get an opportunity to do research. Despite their differences, however, uh, both articles highlight the importance of creating your own psychedelic student organization, a task that a few of us here have done, but is no easy feat. Um, they could also join a chapter of a related um, professional organization such as SSDP or Normal, but really um, they, this is because there are currently no uh, psychedelic professional organizations for students interested in psychedelic research to join. Ultimately, this comes at a huge cost to both um, the students and the psychedelic space. Not having a professional organization available for students means that their community needs cannot be empirically assessed and therefore cannot be adequately addressed. For students that decide to start an organization, their time is often spent inefficiently creating similar but disconnected programs across different academic institutions. 
Finally, the lack of professional student support supports the existing barriers to higher education that disproportionately affect underrepresented minorities, including students at community colleges and conservative universities that would otherwise not have any personal exposure to psychedelic research. In a similar vein, active membership in a professional org has the potential to catapult you into the psychedelic space depending on your level of interest and curiosity. For example, students starting off, can start off by becoming members in local or national chapters where centralized extensive tools, booklets, and guidance make it relatively easy to get involved or even start your own chapter. SSDP is a great example of this, and this is especially helpful for students with low resources or support structures available on campus. Once you get more involved in your chapter, you will likely present at conferences with financial aid if necessary, leading to increased confidence and experience when talking to peers and experts in the field. Abercans is an excellent annual conference catered to minority students that accomplishes exactly this. Uh, this is really, okay. Uh, uh, finally, all of this would culminate in opportunities for research, mentorship, and collaboration um, to promote both personal and professional development and an improved inclusive psychedelic research program for all researchers. In April last year, dozens of college students from across the United States, many just beginning their own psychedelic student orgs, um, came together at Penn and identified the necessity for, for professional orgs in filling a vacant but critical ecological niche in the space. Together, they developed the Intercollegiate Psychedelic Network, or IPN for short. This is the first uh, professional student-run psychedelic organization specifically dedicated to fostering the development of students into the next generation of diverse and interdisciplinary leaders in the field of psychedelic science. After many brainstorming sessions, we boil down the goals of the organization down to three main aims. But for the purpose of time, we will be going over the first of them in detail, and that is promoting diversity, um, both in the field and in the profession. To begin to address this aim, we developed a relevant research program that accounts for evaluation and reevaluation to ensure its success. Uh, we do this through a program lifecycle highlighted here, and we will begin by identifying community needs in the space in the context of our first aim before developing our program. There's an obvious community need in the psychedelic space for diversity. For our purposes, we're defining diversity as BIPOC individuals, although we acknowledge many others exist and have gone also unaddressed. There are many articles, including an excellent six part discussion by Symposium 2016 that exposes this issue to the public and highlights some underlying reasons for why this is, including systemic racism, exclusionary culture, and privilege. Critically, these racial disparities are clear when looking at demographics of participants in clinical research studies. A methodological review of 18 studies demonstrates that on average, people of color, including Blacks and Indigenous people, are highly underrepresented in psychedelic clinical trials when compared to the average national demographic data. Moreover, this leads to issues in generalizability of results and is yet another way BIPOC individuals continue to be left out of the space and denied the potential for healing. When looking at the top 10 psychedelic industries and nonprofit organizations, many of which have currently ongoing clinical trials, there's also a clear overrepresentation of white people and underrepresentation of people of color when compared to the national average in the United States. This past year was the first attempt at providing culturally relevant training for clinicians, many of whom work at these institutions. Similarly, this follows the same trend in academic research institutions. Um, and this past year was also kind of any kind of first attempt at hosting a POC centered psychedelic conference for academics and other stakeholders alike. Collectively, the lack of diversity is rooted in racism and will continue to happen unless we actively purposefully and mindfully change it. Um, lack of diversity leads to a breakdown of healthy psychedelic ecosystem at three tiers, the first of which is the personal individual level. BIPOC individuals in undiverse fields often experience more mental health issues and imposter syndrome relative to the general population, which Victor will go over a little bit. Um, next, the profession and the research field will also suffer from a lack of, re of representative care that will likely affect the quality of care an immeasurable loss of talent and a lack of diversity in thought. Um, and then in the terms of the larger psychedelic space, um, this unintentionally or intentionally provokes an exclusionary uh, culture and engenders a division and mistrust. 
Uh, I'll leave you with this quote, any system without diversity is subject to collapse and failure. In ecology, the more diversity, the more resilience. Resilience is the capacity for a system to recover quickly from difficulties. More diverse people means more ideas, more experiences, more opinions, more resilience. Diversity and inclusion really must be a priority for having a functional and healthy psychedelic e ecosystem. And really at the basis of all this is that we have a moral obligation to ensure and prioritize diversity, inclusion, and representation in the psychedelic space. That brings us to the big picture question. Um, how can we actively cultivate an inclusive and diverse culture within the psychedelic research space? Victor will now describe the development of our program. Sweet, thank you for that background, Emily. Uh, and so when we look at URM representation as how many graduate students do we have, we actually see the disparity is especially pronounced in STEM fields. In fact, while URMs make around 15% of PhD students in non-STEM fields, they make up only 7% of PhD students in STEM. And so we see that it's not just psychedelic field that's struggling with diversity, it's an issue across all of STEM and astrophysics, geology and chemistry. And so when we began our program, we wanted to see what kind of approaches and tools have been used in the past to increase your representation in other fields in STEM. And we found that research experiences for undergraduates, which are fully funded intensive opportunities for hands-on research experience and professional development, have been extremely effective at increasing representation. And research shows that undergrads undergraduate students have widely regarded their RU experiences as beneficial and have credited the research experience for developing self-confidence, analytical skills, independence, and most importantly, the motivation to go on to graduate school. In fact, the Meyerhoff Scholars Program at UMBC, is um, which is unparalleled in increasing retention of URMs in STEM and preparing them to pursue graduate and professional programs, greatly prioritizes the uh, the participation in RUs and helps place students in them. And the figure you see on the right actually shows how increased participation in RUs by students in the Meyerhoff program is associated with increased entry into professional and graduate programs. Every single year that they participate, it's more likely they'll actually be able to move on towards graduate school. So RUs clearly work to increase URM entry into PhD programs. And in the last 20 years, the funding for RU programs has almost tripled by the National Science Foundation because of how effective they are. And RUs have been shown to improve research skills and career pathway knowledge, but exactly how is this happening? So time spent, uh, if we look at time spent on data acquisition and analysis, professional development activities, research skills and learning, lab work, presentation skills, and mentorship quality as factors that can affect uh, the, the total outcome for the RU. We see that all of these things, except for time spent on lab work and presentation skills, were positively associated with increases in research skills and including quantitative skills, overall research process understanding and critical reading skills. But that time spent on professional activities, uh, development activities and research skills and learning activities were uh, associated, possibly associated with significant increases in research skills and that mentorship quality was actually uh, yielded the large, had the largest effect on the research skills index more than any other factor. And the positive and significant effect of these uh, three boxed uh, factors here actually transferred as well to improvements in career pathway variables, such as an understanding of the graduate school process, of graduate school life, and of what careers are available in STEM. And when we tie this back to URMs for a moment, we actually found in, this, uh, in a lot of studies that there weren't any pre-programmed differences across ethnic identities, but the URMs actually had greater post-program ratings in some specific categories, such as understanding of the scientific uh, uh, the process and learning of ethical conduct, skills in oral presentations, and skill in science writing. So RU programs are not only effective at increasing entry into STEM, it seems to actually have a especially strong effect on URMs, making them even more important. But RU's goals extend way beyond just learning research skills and completing a research project. They also aim to promote the development of scientific identity and cultural capital. Students are not only mentored in research, but they're connected to a community of peers who can help them navigate through their research and life experiences during the summer and way beyond that. Altogether, the improvement in research skills and career outlook uh, and the introduction to a community facilitates something that's actually a lot more meaningful, any of these things alone. Um, one of the things that it does is improve research self-efficacy or one's own faith in your ability to uh, do research and understand science. 
And this is something that for many reasons uh, can be vulnerable in URMs, um, even if they are high achieving students. In fact, it's especially vulnerable in high achieving URM students. And so self-efficacy is extremely important because in combination with outcome expectations, that is what informs what your interests are and your interests that inform what your educational and your occupational choice goals are, which informs your direct and indirect actions to achieving those goals. And finally, you'll experience performance attainments or outcomes, consequences of your actions, which would be positive or negative. And your self-perception is going to, and how you identify is going to determine how this feeds back ultimately to modulate your self-efficacy and outcome expectations. But despite how important self-efficacy actually is, it's not enough. In longitudinal models of diverse students, science identity and value internalization are actually more durable predictors of persistence and integration into a community of scientists than just self-efficacy alone. It is necessary to actually see yourself as a scientist. And there are three overlapping components of a strong science identity, competence, performance, and recognition. Uh, competence, it, it's demonstrated through one's understanding of knowledge and, this, and the scientific skills. Performance uh, of, is evaluated by uh, relevant scientific practices and application of tools. And finally, uh, recognition is achieved by acknowledging of oneself as a scientist, but also being recognized by meaningful others as a science person. And all these two, these two things together really are what helps propel URMs into graduate school from an RU program. And as we talked about earlier, mentorship has the capacity to really improve research skills and career pathway knowledge, but it's more than just that. Mentorship is key for cultivating self-efficacy and science identity. Research on undergraduates has confirmed that it plays a critical role in contributing to the development of science identity by, because mentors are responsible for recognizing talent, validating mentee aspirations, teaching them how to do science, and giving them the opportunities to take on research tasks that are consistent with their level of de developing competence. And even past undergraduate URMs in STEM fields and academia ranked mentorship as the most important factor in their current success. And for URM specifically, it's extremely helpful to have a mentor that you can personally identify with due to shared social, cultural, and ethnic backgrounds. But this has not always been well executed. In fact, a study of mentors for URMs discovered that most mentors had an incomplete understanding of how differences in culture could contribute to underrepresented students' experience in the lab. And they did not think that ethnic identity and diversity was an important factor in their mentor-mentee relationships. Basically, a lot of these mentors took a colorblind approach, yet, Individuals primed with colorblindness have been shown to exhibit more behavioral prejudice. And partnering with colorblind individuals uh, uh, by URMs has actually shown that it mediates decreased cognitive performance in URMs. And so it's not only going to impede their, their ability to have uh, the ultimate um, benefits from uh, participating in these experiences if mentorship is not done right, it could actually harm, their, uh, harm them and create negative outcomes. And so integrating all of this information, we decided to create the Intercollegiate Psychedelic Network uh, Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship, or IPN SURF. It is a 10-week paid program with an emphasis on URM recruitment. And now we're just going to go over a little bit of the uh, aspects of this. First is financial support for students. We provide financial support by covering the travel to the host university, room and board, as well as a $4,000 stipend. Additionally, we place students in labs where they can work on supervised research projects, and by the end of the summer, they can produce an oral and poster presentation in front of their new peers and the broader university research community, as well as creating a one-page abstract for our internal publications. We also provide academic support by setting up GRE prep courses, research skill seminars, and small group sessions for improving effective scientific communication. We also host networking events to help build students' professional network and their confidence with networking at conferences. Career panels for students to learn about paths in academia, industry, advocacy, and writing, and workshops for how to apply to graduate school. And of course, being a psychedelic organization, we deeply value mental health, which isn't always the case in academic settings. As such, we will make sure to help students cultivate a good work-life balance, provide regular mindfulness workshops to address the imposter syndrome that affects many high achieving URMs and through uh, co-housing and social activities, we hope to foster a sense of family in our cohorts of students that will promote a really helpful peer support network. And finally, as we were discussing, mentorship is key. And so we are going to implement a multi-mentor strategy um, that uh, relies on faculty, 
primary research mentors, which are usually going to be graduate students, and program assistant mentors. The faculty mentors will help with career and research mentorship. The research mentor will provide daily research supervision guidance and will be responsible for the development of self-efficacy um, by giving them tasks that they are ready to handle and providing love and nurture through their inevitable failures, because that is how science works. Uh, and but there is no way that you know given the lack of diversity in these lab settings that we could really match up a urm with uh, another urm mentor and so that's where the program assistant mentors come in they will be students from other labs that are uh, other labs that maybe aren't doing psychedelic science but are urms and will nonetheless be able to help guide weekly small group and one-on-one -on -one meetings um, as an opportunity for the students to practice their presentations share their struggles that they're having in the lab and basically creating a safe space in the program so that any issues that arise within the lab culture that the student is in uh, can be um, dealt with and can be brought to the attention of the program. And with that, I'm gonna uh, take it off to Margaret to go through the program life cycle. Thanks, Victor. Uh, sorry for the Thanks. development of key performance indicators. That's all right. Thanks, Victor. Yep, the next step is uh, developing key, key performance indicators or KPIs, which turn your work into an object of research and they're used to measure programmatic success, monitor program health, analyze patterns over time and contribute to the growing body of knowledge for something that we really care about. So how might we go about developing these KPIs? Well, first we need to look at the student experience. We can start by identifying different measurable aspects of the program. So when a student enters the program, they'll be faced with different components of the experience, include, including a division of responsibility, mediating artifacts like workshops, rules to adhere to, a new community, and a goal that they're working towards, which is essentially improved research skills. The intended outcome for the student is that she has a greater likelihood of entering and enjoying a career in psychedelic science. But what we know from cultural history activity theory or chat is that this process is not so clean. It's, it's, uh, chat is, chat's proposal is based upon a 30 year analysis of one of the longest running REU programs. So it's a really reliable source for us. And what it tells us is that the subject is entering into a complex system whose components are varying complex and interacting with each other. This research on summer, uh, summer research experiences reinforces this concept um, and when the researcher McDivitt states can, that uh, such programs can potentially fail students with the socio-cultural historical underpinnings of the program are not paid attention to, which is something that Victor touched upon earlier. The key performance metrics, therefore, that we use need to be designed to help students optimize their research skills and navigate the socio-cultural realities um, that they bring with them and that they'll be entering into um with uh with their marginalized marginalized ident identities given the complications of the network we can't just track each of these activities separately we need to focus on the journey so um taking that network approach we're also going to integrate kpis um which uh just a quick review here on these um they need to have a time frame they're pointed they're contextually realistic um, they're operationally feasible and they're measurable either quantitatively or qualitatively. I like to add that KPI should also um, pose an opportunity for self-reflection um, in order for the person who's engaging with them to learn something from the process itself. So I'll just jump into um, our different areas of KPIs here. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, I know we're kind of running short on time, so I'll do a quick overview. Generally, stakeholder satisfaction measures how satisfied stakeholders are with the components and outcomes of their experience. So stakeholders include faculty, mentors, students, um, and um, just understanding what their experience was like. Quality of service measures whether or not we actually achieved what we set out to do. We want to know, are students actually continuing on with research or are we failing at that? By asking a bunch of different questions, we're able to pinpoint exactly um, where we might be doing a good job or not so good of a job in this. And the final KPI set that I'll introduce here um, is the social impact. And my favorite one of these is the percent growth of BIPOC researchers in the field of psychedelic science from IPN Surf. Um, a huge goal of this program is to be exceptional, is to, is to make the psychedelic field exceptionally diverse in research and uh, so that we can serve populations who need it, um, who need the clinical intervention, who, um, you know, we, we need to diversify the field and, and um, have the understanding and the breadth of research that comes with that. Um, so I'll wrap things up here. We do have a few more slides, but um, I can wrap things up here since we're um, wrapping 
now and there's a, a q a session i am not sure if there are any questions that are coming in um but i did get a notification about it so hey folks um, I can jump in and ask a couple of questions, but thank you all so much for uh, for the presentation, for your work, um, also just for flawlessly matching today. Um, you know, that's uh, also a great. We call. we did call each other. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So I mean, you know, this this is really important. This is something that we're talking about a lot right now. Um, with a lot of different organizations uh, kind of being more on the startup uh, side of things is, you know, how do we continue diversifying the space because it is a significant problem. You know, there's a problem with research. There's also an immense problem in the startup ecosystem, both in psychedelics and outside of psychedelics. I think it's like 2.2% of uh, startup companies have um, you know, venture funded companies have female founders. So it's, it's pretty abysmal uh, in, in every respect. Um, I was wondering if uh, y'all could talk about, you know, you've clearly developed this program that you're hoping to launch specifically for researchers. Have there been any talks by the IPN network to specifically develop this for the startup ecosystem that's budding um, within psychedelics? I, I know Raul uh, personally, and I know he's, you know, interned at Compass, and uh, there's some other folks uh, that I've, I've met from the IPN network who I know are looking to engage with more of the startup side of things. So just was hoping to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah, um, we were excited to kind of present a little bit more on the research side um, because uh, Victor and Emily, I don't want to steal their thunder, but they actually went through one of these programs um, and it, it really shaped their future and what happened with them. Um, so in terms of um, structuring something in the startup side, we've, we've talked about it. I was actually on the phone with Rahul yesterday talking about it, but in a very informal way. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to identify quality uh, organizations right now in that space because they're not quite as developed or um, longstanding as the academic spaces. Um, but um, but yeah, it has been a, a concept and I, I really in, in like the question because it prompts us to think a little bit more about it. Mm -hmm, definitely. The, the other thing that I would be really curious about is, you know, you have these um, awesome kind of programs that are uh, taking students, launching them to all of these different universities, allowing them to do research. Uh, is there a culture of, you know, uh, incubation within the IPN network? You know, do you, as you guys are, you know, you're, you're clearly on a college campus. Many of you are geographically connected, or at least some of you are. Um, you know, what does that process look like of having a community of college students who are not only, you know, interested in psychedelics in more of a recreational sense, um, and maybe not even in uh, just kind of like a, um, reading group type sense, but actually in a professional sense and being able to both weave in these lessons personally and allow for them to kind of uh, push you forward professionally as well. I, w I would love to hear about that aspect of things. Yeah, Victor, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, um, so I, I think that, yeah, we we want to, um, the one of the goals of this program is to create like a cohort of students that they do feel very connected like through the shared experience so that they continue to support each other and uh, push each other throughout like the rest of their careers, whether they go into industry, grad school, um, or to do a startup of their own. And that from their, uh, their collective kind of like uh, energy that that helps, uh, that, that kind of like radiates out into IPN and that um, they form uh, sort of like uh, informal uh, peer, uh, peer mentorship with the rest of the network. Um, so we, we hope that, that that's kind of how it, it spreads and incubates like in the, the greater IPN uh, community. So even students that aren't at these programs are still kind of receiving a residual benefit because we're introducing them to um, these, these peers that are now have this like re-lit re um, confidence to pursue a career with STEM. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And uh, what does, you know, if this is, if th this program is very much the, I guess, psychedelic assisted therapy session, um, what does the integration process for it look like, uh, if you can make that comparison? If that mm. question doesn't make sense, happy to. No, yeah. no, no I, I think, no, I think it's a good question. I think that it's important to have a, a lot of support even after the RU program is over. So for Emily and I, we were part of something similar to the Meyerhoff Scholar Program called the Millennium Scholars Program. Uh, and it wasn't just that we did summers, it was that we had a lot of uh, uh, support from uh, program coordinators even during the school year. Uh, and we felt comfortable being able to reach out and ask for advice and help and questions. And so I think an important part is that we track students afterwards and we reach out to ask 
you know, what, what are, what are you uh, struggling with? Are you thinking about dropping out of uh, changing majors out of STEM to something else? Are you thinking about not applying to graduate school? Do you think maybe, you know, do you feel insecure about like, what, what are you going through and providing support continuously? So that's a system that's very important to have set up because even once people leave this really supportive environment, the sorts of issues that kind of keep URMs from going to STEM careers in the first place are going to be there. All the, the stigma, all the, uh, uh, the experiences that lead to one feeling imposter syndrome are going to reemerge. And so it's important to kind of help give, give that support throughout their academic careers. Mm -hmm. Well, beautiful. I think we're running out of time. Margaret, Victor, Emily, thank you all so much for coming on, sharing really cool work and excited to be talking further offline. Yeah, thanks so much. We're excited to be here and uh, just grateful to you for the programming and the effort that's gone into this. So thanks to you. Of course. Be well, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.